And uh, what we're going to be doing the next uh, few weeks is actually looking at a continuation of the message that we, uh, we had last week. So I would encourage you, if you haven't listened to last week's message, to actually go back onto our website and look for the message entitled, You Are My Witnesses. And that's where we break down what it means... Um, that what that phrase means, you are my witnesses. And what Jesus was saying there and what the scriptures teach is that we are witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus. In other words, we have not only uh, experienced uh, an encounter with the resurrected Jesus, but we ourselves, by the message we proclaim and the life we live, are actually witnessing or, or giving a testimony to the fact that Jesus is alive. Now, the way I've been thinking about that is that we are witnesses to the resurrected Jesus when we start looking like and living like Jesus. When other people actually start wondering if it's true because they see his resemblance in us. And for me this week, that's been probably the most profound thought as I've just wrestled with what it means to be a witness for Jesus. And so this is how Jesus lived his life. We would look at the life of Christ and then we would look at the way in which we we, we follow his footsteps and, and ways in which the spirit of God is making us more like Jesus so that we're more and more resembling Jesus. And there are three things, at least three, probably a list of maybe 25 things if we were to be more comprehensive. But I came up with three things that I saw that Jesus walked in that if we were walking in, we would have everything we need for becoming more like Jesus, for becoming more of a reflection of Jesus, and for being a living uh, witness to his resurrection. The first is assurance of God's love. So these three will be up on the screen, but the first is assurance of God's love. Jesus walked in full confidence of God's love for him. We'll talk about that one today. Next week, we'll look at the second one, which is obedience to God's word. Jesus walked in full obedience to God's word. And then the third one will be just a couple of weeks from now, which is full dependence or reliance upon God's spirit. This is how Jesus walked. This is what made everything he did possible. Now realize that what we could do is read the Bible, we could actually look at the life of Christ, and we could say to ourselves, well, Jesus did all those things because he's God. And since I'm not God, I really can't do all the things that Jesus did. Now, the way I would see it is that Jesus Christ, although he was God, didn't seek to grasp his, his identity as God, didn't seek to make himself known that way, uh, sort of in an in a, in a overt way. He actually was fully reliant on God's Holy Spirit, fully obedient to God's word, and full of assurance in God's love. And I think through that, he was able to do all that he did. Now, the reason I'm saying that is because if we can walk in full assurance of God's love, if we can walk in full obedience to God's word, and you can't just go do everything Jesus did, you do what God tells you to do. But nonetheless, we walk in full obedience to God's word and walking in full dependence upon his Holy Spirit, we can begin to live lives that reflect in any way or in every way the life of Jesus himself. That's the beauty of what Jesus accomplished for us. Yes, he was 100% God. Yes, he was 100% man, just like us. And so as we focus on the first of these three um, today, we're looking at assurance of God's love. And the reason we're, we're looking at the life of Christ is because I think we can also experience these same things that Jesus experienced and walk in this same truth. And I think this is how, over the next three weeks, this is how our lives become a living witness Not just one of proclamation that Jesus woke up from the dead, that he has risen and that he is alive, but there's actually evidence of his resurrection by the way we live and by the way we interact. Now, the first of those would be assurance of God's love. So let's look at that. In Matthew chapter 3 and Matthew chapter 17, there are two accounts here of the words of God the Father speaking over his son Jesus. And I want to focus on just Matthew 3 verse 17. So just to look at that verse... I want to just focus on that one, and I want you to see the assurance of of the Father's love that he speaks over his Son. It says, and a voice from heaven said, this is my dearly loved Son who brings me great joy. Do you hear those words? 
Maybe your version says something like, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Now, what's interesting is a couple of things that I think stand out for me. And the first is that these words of the father to the son were spoken about him, spoken to him before his three and a half year stint in ministry. So Jesus was on the earth for 30 years. Then he has his baptism. Then these words are spoken over him at his baptism. And then he has about three and a half years of actual, what you might call actual, I guess, but three and a half years of ministry, ministering. And most of the gospels actually you know, 98% of the four books about Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, actually are written about the last three and a half years of his life. In other words, there's just very little about the first 30 years. Now, the reason I'm saying that is because for some of us, we think that once we get to heaven, if we've been good enough, then we'll finally hear words that sound like that. Welcome to eternal life, my dear loved son, my dear loved daughter. You did a good job, and I'm proud of you. Some of us, we're just hoping he says welcome, and then maybe we can just kind of fly in, you know, off the radar a little bit. What I guess I'm saying and what stands out to me about these words over Jesus is that actually God spoke these words before he actually went into ministry, before he had things that he could sort of mark as well done, well done, well done. Before his performance, God had already spoken these words to him. And I guess what I, I want you to see is that God's not waiting until you behave a little more rightly before he's willing to confer his love upon you. Do you see that? These words come to Jesus before his ministry, which tells me that the power in his ministry comes from relying upon the fact that these words are true. So he wasn't trying to earn God's approval. He was working because, and, and, and doing it in great delight to serve the Father because he already had God's approval. That would be my hope for us at Anchor Church and really any believer around the world, that they could walk in that kind of freedom and that kind of assurance so that they're not actually trying to sort of you know, strive to attain this, this statement here that God dearly loves us and that we would bring him great joy, but that we would understand that before we do anything we do, when we wake up in the morning and before we, even before we brush our teeth, God says, I love you and I take great joy in you. Now, I know these words were spoken to Jesus, but what I want you to see is that when we talk about Jesus Christ dying on the cross and being buried and then being risen from the grave and receiving full acceptance for his sacrifice of God, and then, and, and then when we come to faith in God and we say, thank you, Jesus, for taking my place and my sin away from me. Thank you for your forgiveness and for your love, God. I receive that. I really do believe that. Then what happens in a moment is that what we understand is that Christ took our sin on the cross and he dealt with it. And then in the moment of faith, God gives us Christ's righteousness, his right standing with God, which means that everything that would be true about the standing of, of Jesus with God the Father is now true about us. If God the Father loves Jesus, then when we're found in Jesus, does he not love us too? He does. He does. If God the Father is well pleased with his son Jesus, and, and when he looks at me, what he sees is Jesus, and Jesus having paid the price for my sin and removed it, and all he sees is the right standing of Jesus when he looks at me, then is he not well pleased with me as his child? He is. That's good news. That's what it means to walk in assurance of God's love, to walk in assurance of faith. Now, what happens when we, when we don't walk in assurance is that we begin to fall into sinful patterns or broken patterns of relating to people. We begin to compare ourselves with others to see if God really does love us or to measure sort of our own love for God against how much someone else loves God, at least from our perspective. So unless we're resting in God's love for us, the, the only other option then is to begin comparing my love for God to what I'm seeing in other people. I think it, it leads us to a place of comparison. I think it leads us to a place of condemnation. Because the truth is, if on a regular basis or on a daily basis, or let's just go with a weekly basis, I were to evaluate my relationship with God based on the measure or the level of love I feel for him or the measure of love that my actions are displaying in terms of my disobedience, 
then I think I'd have, to, I'd have to not only be grieved, but I think over the course of time, I would begin to fall into condemnation. The truth is, if it were to me and the measure of my love for God, even on my best days, I think I'd, I'd fall under the weight of, of, of condemnation. I would, not, I, I would not measure up. I would fall short. So for, for me, as I think about having assurance, <clears throat> if, if we don't, we're operating with a measure of deficiency and confidence, which means for me, and maybe this isn't true about you, but for me, what that means then and where that leads me is to operating out of a place of insecurity or operating out of a place of fear. And for some of us, it could be operating out of a place of pride because we feel like we do in, in many ways measure up. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not able always to say that. So I feel like I'm more operating out of insecurity and fear if I don't have this confidence of God's love for me or this confidence confidence that I am a Christian, that I do have eternal life, and that I will go to be with the Lord when I die, and that he will give me a new body, and I will live with him forever in the new heavens and, in, and new earth. Look at the way uh, he, he wants us to have confidence in the scriptures. John writes in 1 John 4, um, verse, well, let's start in verse 16 to 19. In verse 16, it says, we know how much God loves us, and we've put our trust in his love. So the difference there between knowing how much God loves us and then putting our trust in God's love. We've talked about that, but it's really good to mention that those two can be different things. I can know God loves me, and I can struggle to put my trust in his love for me. He says here, God is love, and all who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment, but we can face him with confidence. The scriptures are being written so that we can face God with confidence, having assurance of, of, it, of being in good standing and right relationship with him. But, but it's not on the basis of your behavior or your performance. Look at what, it, what, what it's on the basis of here. It says we can, we can face him with confidence or have assurance with God because we live like Jesus here in the world. That's what the next three sermons are describing, living like Jesus. The first way that Jesus lived was in full assurance of God's love, then full obedience to his word, and then full dependence or reliance upon his spirit. So this is how we'll have confidence. He says, such love has no fear because perfect love casts out all fear. If we are afraid, it's for fear of punishment, and it shows that we've not fully experienced his perfect love. Did you know that you can experience his perfect love and not fully experience his perfect love? What I mean is that when we come to faith in God, we receive this good news that God loved us so much that he sent his son to take our place for the punishment of our sins, to remove it out of the way so that we could have access to God, be welcomed by God into his family as one of his dearly loved children. That's true. We come to realize that. We embrace God's love for us. But the process of sanctification, it's a big word, but the process of becoming more like Jesus that process is, I would, I would summarize it as a process of coming to more fully understand God's love. That's what that process is. That's what he's describing here. If there are times where we are afraid, times where we're dealing in insecurity, it shows that we're not fully experiencing or had not fully experienced his perfect love. We love each other, verse 19, because he first loved us. So the real issue here for us when we're talking about having assurance of God's love for us is understanding his love for us can free us from every other evil, from every form of sin and brokenness. When there is sin, it's rooted in unbelief. And when there is unbelief, it's rooted in the lack of knowledge or the lack of trust in God's love. That's what we just read. So here's how knowing God's love can be life-changing for us. If I know that God loves me, and I know that I'm fully accepted by him, even when I make mistakes, then it's not so debilitating when I don't have the acceptance of that group at school that always seems to exclude me. Or that circle of friends in the break room at work that I just don't quite seem to fit in, or I just can't quite seem to get their approval. Now, I know that hurts, and I know that those kinds of things are a struggle for most of us, 
But I think what happens here in realizing God's love more perfectly is that we become more and more confident in what God is doing in our lives and who he is, what he's doing in our lives, what he's done for us, so that we realize how, how genuinely accepted and loved by God our Father we are. And it leaves no real gaping hole for the need for someone else to fill that. So when we're looking at this, God's love really does free us from needing anyone else's love or acceptance as a primary source of validation. Now, there's primary sources and then there's secondary sources. Wanting the approval of our parents as a secondary source of validation is a good thing, and we should seek out the advice of our parents if we're old enough for that now. Wanting the, the, uh, the, the approval of our friends and really wanting to, to, to do what's right by them and to really seek to, to care for them and show them love in a way that is a, sort of a mutual respect and mutual approval of one another. That, as long as it's secondary, I think it's a really wonderful thing. As long as the love I have for my spouse and for my friends and for my children, as long as that love remains at a secondary level where it's not my primary identity or my primary source of validation, I think it's a wonderful thing. There's nothing really inherently wrong with that. What happens is that someone's approval or the need for someone's love becomes a primary issue in our lives. It becomes a primary source of validation. And do you know how to tell when something has gone from secondary to a primary affection for us? when the love of that thing or the need for that thing actually begins to manifest in sin or not love towards others. Now, for us, I think as we, as we talk more about this, we're being, what I want us to do is be primarily controlled by, compelled by, or motivated by God's love. Paul says that in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 14 and 15. Just look at it with me here. It says, either way, Christ's love controls us. That word controls is a word that is sometimes translated compels, a word that is sometimes translated constrains us. I think a word that you could also use here uh, to translate would be motivates us. It is the controlling, motivating factor behind everything we do. Now, the motivating factor here isn't my love for Christ, but it's the other way around. That's what's so unique about Christianity when you really understand the gospel is that it reverses the process, becoming more and more sanctified or more and more holy or more and more righteous in a way, in a sense, isn't really more of what you can do, but more realization of what he has done. And that prompts uh, that prompts the, the, the process of, of becoming more like Jesus. So either way, Christ's love motivates us because we believe that since Christ died for everyone, we also believe that we have all died to our old life. And having died to our old life, he died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves, but they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. Look at Galatians 2.20. My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who now lives in me. So I live this earthly body by doing everything I can to try and please God because I feel the weight of needing to do what's right. Sorry, that was the wrong version. Let me read the right version. It's no longer me that lives, but Christ in me, so I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God, who did two things, loved me and gave himself for me. If you're looking for freedom to become more like Jesus, if you're looking for, if you're looking for some sense of validation that you are a Christian, that you will die, that you will be in the presence of God, and that he will give you a new body, and you will live with him forever, you want assurance of eternal life and abundant life, I would say you need to go back to this phrase here, where we live this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God, and go to those two things, trusting that the Son of God loves me, you've got to wrestle with that as long as it takes until you finally believe it. The Son of God loves me. And secondly, the Son of God gave himself for me. Now, the word gave himself for me, or that phrase, really speaks to the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus and what he accomplished for us by giving himself for us, by being the Lamb of God who was slain before the foundation of the world and for our sins. That's what it means. So if you're looking for assurance, you're going to need to go back to those things. 
We live by faith in the Son of God. We live by faith in him, and this faith in him makes us more like him. And I think that drives a real sense of assurance in our lives. So as we, as we study this a, a little more, um, when we talk about having assurance, we can, just so we're clear, first we can actually have this measure of assurance of eternal life with God. It's not uncommon for me to actually talk with someone about whether or not they, they've ever encountered Christ or whether or not they've ever received Christ or whether or not um, they're in relationship with God just in talking with them. And for some folks to really say, I don't know that you can ever really know if, you, if you're, if you're going to go to heaven when you die. Now, I don't use that language. I more or less, um, I more, more or less use the language of living with God forever or, or eternal life. That's how I think the Bible teaches it. So as we talk about eternal life... <clears throat> It's not unusual for me to say, for me to run into someone who really isn't sure and doesn't think anyone can be that sure um, that, they'll, that they'll live with God forever, even after they die. And what I would say is that th- there are more than a handful of verses that teach us that we can know, and, and, and more verses than a handful that teach us how we can know that we are in relationship with God. So the first point I'm making is that we can actually know. And then to, to be, take it further, when I talk about having assurance of, of God's love, the reason I've phrased it that way is because I want you to realize that when we talk about assurance of faith or, or having a sense of confidence that we will live with God forever, I'm, I'm really strictly talking about the status uh, of our soul. I'm really strictly talking about whether or not we actually will live with God for all eternity. I'm not talking about a kind of assurance that bleeds into everything else you believe. Uh, I guess the reason, the reason I say that is, is because we're talking about a growing sense of confidence in God's love for us, and unfortunately for too many people who call themselves Christians, they put too much confidence in the other things they believe. And just because my faith in Christ is placed in the right place and I've received forgiveness of my sins, that doesn't mean or, or that, that I can assume that all of my actions from that point on and all of my thoughts about the way the world operates and all of my dealings and the way I relate to people are as correct as, as what I realized was true about God. I think um, in talking with a friend, he shared um, some, some notes with me that said that, uh, and I thought, I thought this was really good too. You know, Peter, who actually walked with Jesus, one of his disciples, one of his followers, walking with Jesus for three years, three and a half years, and probably knew him for a lot longer than that, is in relationship with Jesus. His life is being transformed, and it's not a matter of just, you know, just a few years or so after Jesus is resurrected, and Peter is now one of the apostles proclaiming the gospel and taking the gospel wherever God sends him to go. It's, it's within a few years that Peter falls back into some racist tendencies, some ethnic preference for Jews over Gentiles. And Paul in Galatians actually has to stand up and confront Peter in front of everyone because his behavior was done in front of everyone to say, we are not allowed any longer to really prefer or to segregate ourselves from those. Christ has actually broken down the wall of hostility. He actually reminds him of the good news of Jesus. I guess the reason I'm saying that is I want us to grow in such confidence of God's love for us that we find all kinds of freedom to go and to do all that he asks us to do. But what I don't want you to hear me saying is that when you come to faith and when you embrace this, that that's really all you need to know. You can just go back to your old ways of dealing. How did you grow up in your family? Well, you can export that and import that right here into the church. It doesn't work that way. The truth is once we come to faith, there's a lot of room to grow. And I want us to be a church that doesn't take for granted or, or just assume that, that what we've believed or what we were taught um, is, some, is sort of a, a right way of thinking or a right way of behaving. I want us to be a people who are continually learning, continually growing, continually being stretched by, by listening to others who are different than us, by, by, by actually empathizing with people whose experiences might be different than us, and not by assuming anything else except that the gospel is true and I have a lot to learn in every other area of my life. 
I think this is the way forward for us. So that was just a sort of a caveat here to not have an overconfidence or overassurance in our beliefs or teachings because sometimes the things that we believe, believe it or not, some of the things that I believe have actually been used um, to justify poor treatment or injustice of other people. So I not only have to differentiate my doctrine, our doctrine as Anchor Church from wrong doctrine, we also have to differentiate the doctrine we believe from the bad ways people have used good doctrine. And so as I'm, as I'm studying this, I think when we talk about having full assurance, there's really only one thing we have full assurance of, and that's God's love for us. Now, believing God really does love us and his acceptance of us is unconditional, then when I do make a mistake or do have a misstep in some way, then I'm totally free to just work on it without any condemnation or feeling the weight of shame. I can look at it and I can say, now this was wrong and you were right and I apologize and I want to get it right. I want to work on this because I'm so free in God's love. I'll never, ever be condemned. That's the posture I want for us. Now, now, just real quickly in the next few minutes, in terms of, when I say next few minutes, I mean 10, okay. So now in terms of actually being assured of God's love and having eternal life, it seems that followers of Jesus really have asked this question as far back as the beginning of the church. In 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13, it stands as one of the key verses in the book of 1 John. And, and the way he says, that, says it here is that he's writing this book so that we can know something. He says, I've written this to you who believe in the name of Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. This is a verse I would take someone to that might say, I just don't know if you can know. I don't think you can ever really know. I would say, read the book of 1 John, read the whole thing, and read it over and over again until you do know. Because John says, I wrote this book so that you would know. You can have assurance that God loves you, that you're in good standing with him, in good relationship with him. And if you have to, read 1 John a thousand times until you get there. But he says, I wrote this book for that reason. So the burden of John in this whole letter is to teach us how to be sure God abides in us and we abide in him. And the question for us is, are we sure that God abides in us and that we abide in him? Now, there are three tests that I borrowed from Sam Storms about three or so years ago when we did a sermon series on the book of 1 John. And I think those messages may be up on our website somewhere. So you can probably unpack this a little more if you go back to the First John sermon series. But there were three tests that Sam Storms gave that I borrowed. And these would be the three tests for assurance that John actually works through. He says, one is the belief factor. Have you ever believed in the good news about Jesus, the forgiveness, the love and the forgiveness that God the Father extends to us because of what Jesus has done. There's the belief factor. The second one is the obedience factor. Are you walking in obedience to God? That would be another another test. And then the last one would be the love factor. Do you love the brothers and sisters? Do you love others? And John uses in his book, he sort of explains all of that and unpacks all of that, but that would be the love factor, these three tests that you get in 1 John for actually working through a sense of assurance. Are these things true? But remember, he wants us to be assured of something. So the, the, the way most of us would approach this question when I say, are you sure that you have eternal life? We might say, well, I, I don't know. Do I truly love God enough? Am I doing enough? And John presents it in a way as to say, do you truly know and trust in God's love for you? That's how you would know. So we're not evaluating our own commitment to God or our own performance or behavior. We're actually actually evaluating his commitment to us and the performance of Jesus on our behalf. We're evaluating whether belief in Christ's performance has changed our lives. So in terms of the three tests, it's not so much do I believe enough or do I love others enough or do I, do I obey God enough or do I measure up in some way because all of us would say our performance is lacking, maybe even on our best days. What we're talking about is Christ's performance and asking, have I been changed by what he's done for me? Now, if we're really asking, am I a Christian, I think there's an objective basis for discovering or, or having assurance in, if, of faith and there's a subjective basis for having assurance of our faith. 
The objective basis for our assurance really is Trinitarian. That means Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We look at the Trinity, we look at the Scriptures and what it teaches us about God, and we understand, number one, the Father loves creation and He loves mankind. That's objective. The Bible teaches that. The second objective reality for us that would give us assurance is that Christ's work on the cross and his resurrection from the grave was accomplished to save us. It's his work for us. That's an objective truth. You go back to that. The third is that the Holy Spirit is working in our lives to make us more like Jesus. So if you're saying, I just don't know if I'm a Christian, I don't know if I have eternal life, go back to those three objective truths and wrestle with them. You'll find them in 1 John. I've given you several steps to take already, but you can find it in 1 John. But you go back to those obje- that, that objective or having an objective basis for assurance of faith. Does the Father love me? Yes, he does. Is Christ's work finished and accomplished for me? Yes, it is. Is the Holy Spirit working in my life and can he do that? Yes, he can. And there's an objective basis there, but then there's a subjective basis for assurance too. Once we believe in all that we've just described here, the Father's love and Christ's finished work for us and the Spirit's ongoing work in our lives, then there begins to manifest a subjective basis for assurance in our lives, meaning it's actually evidence we can see, and I would think it's rooted in those three tests I gave you. There's Jesus, the objective basis for assurance, and then there's us becoming more like Jesus, which is sort of an ongoing subjective basis for assurance. That would be the belief factor, the obedience factor and, and um, the love factor. The, the, the reason we need assurance in our lives is because we're probably craving to have God's affirmation. We do want to know that he loves us. We want to know that we're in close relationship with him. And as we look at this, this notion of assurance, what happens in our lives with, with the, the objective basis and the subjective basis is if we don't feel like we're sure whether or not we have eternal life, we almost always go first to the subjective basis for assurance. We almost always go to those, those secondary things, and we look at ourselves and we go, do I believe enough? I don't know. Did I, was, that, was that real prayer or fake prayer? I, I don't know. Was that, so do I love others? I don't know. Sometimes I do, but sometimes I don't, so maybe I'm not. Am I really obedient? Yeah, one day of the month, maybe, but not always, and so I'm struggling. And we go to these subjective bases for assurance and try to work our way back to the objective, I mean, the subjective working our way back to objective. And I would say, no, as Christians, let's go, as believers in the good news of Jesus, what he wants for us is to work the other angle, to actually start with objective faith until we're confident that Father loves us, Christ's work was finished for us. We are fully accepted by God, and the Spirit will do His work in us. And from there, the secondary basis of assurance just begins to manifest. You don't have to try to love people. You need to believe the gospel and let that manifest love for people. You don't need to try to believe harder. You need to listen to the gospel of Jesus Christ until it dawns on you that it's true. Then you're walking in belief. Same with obedience. You don't need to try to obey just to obey. You listen to the gospel. You believe the gospel. And it does something at the motivational level that enables you to walk in obedience. So this is fruit. And this is what we believe. This is the cause. And this is the effect. Now, another, this is a sort of a, there's like six sermons in here. So the the, the sixth sermon here is um, that assurance and good works um, are, are actually directly proportionate. Now, that's a, a math term. Who's a, I'm a math major. Was anyone else a math major? No one. Everyone hates math. That's awesome. Well, I'll just leave now. <laughs> so uh, good works and assurance in our lives are directly proportionate. That means when one goes up, the other goes up. What happens in our lives um, when we actually believe the objective basis for acceptance with God or, or assurance with God that we're a Christian, that we have eternal life, when we believe those truths about the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, it begins to produce these effects. And these effects begin to reconfirm that we do believe these truths. And when we're reconfirmed and reestablished in our faith, it produces even more fruit. And it's this ongoing cycle. And I hate to put it this way, but it's a case of the rich get richer. It's a case where when you really go to the objective truth and rest in it, when you're really embracing the gospel for all of its good news, it begins to produce an effect in us that gives us even more confidence. And even more confidence leads us to even more belief. And even more belief leads us to even more confidence. 
So they're directly proportionate. And I think in, in the case of those who really don't have assurance or are really struggling, well, <clears throat> that's because we're probably lacking in either the faith and objective basis, faith in, in the good news of the Father's love and the Son's work and the Spirit's work, or we're looking at our lives and we see that it's lacking in those three tests. There really isn't a lot of belief. There really isn't any obedience. There really isn't any love. And what that does is it begins to actually fuel uh, uncertainty in our lives. So when someone says, I'm not sure if I'm a Christian, then I always start with objective truths. Well, have you ever believed these truths that God loves you? Have you ever believed that Christ did this work and I explain it? Have you ever believed that God's spirit could come and, and finish that work in you over time? Well, yeah, no, I've never believed that. Well, let's believe that. And then I walk them through the gospel. If they have, then I would say, so what you're telling me then, I guess, is probably that there's just no evidence of it in your life. Yeah, actually, there's just, there's this sin or this sin pattern. And, and the reason I'm saying this, um, because if, if, um, if good works and assurance are directly proportionate so that the more, uh, the more that we see of good works, the more assurance we have, and it just keeps cycling into more and more, then, then assurance and sin or unbelief are indirectly proportionate. Meaning the more we sin, the less assurance we have. The more unbelief there is, the less assurance we have. So for us, as we talk about it, there's a battle here for assurance. Some people actually feel uncertain about their relationship with God, and they actually lack certainty. And so for us, what I would say is that if our starting place for assurance is the objective truths in the Scripture, which would be belief, then our starting place for lack of assurance would be unbelief. And we go to those objective truths. You remember last week from John chapter 6 and verse 29, the Pharisees, the religious leaders said, okay, Jesus, you're talking all this stuff, but what do you want us to do? What should we be doing then? And Jesus in John 6, 29 says, this is what you need to do. Believe in the Son of God. Believe. And this belief is what God wants you to do. So how do we regain assurance? We go back to those objective truths and then we pray and we rest until those truths begin to actually make fruit in our lives. That's what we do. So when we're searching, we look for the Father's love, the Son's sacrifice, the Spirit's ongoing work. And I might ask, is there anyone here who struggles with assurance? lacking this real confidence in either God's love or that Christ's work was done or that the Holy Spirit isn't done with you or maybe he is and you're not sure because this was the last time probably that you did that same sin and you're gonna, he's just not going to take you back. Maybe there's that measure of insecurity or lack of assurance in your life. And, and I, guess, I guess what I would say is that we evaluate all that Christ has done for us. You might hear me saying, well, then work harder. Do better. You got this. This week, man, just turn it around. Don't do that thing again. Don't think that way again. Don't have those emotions. Suppress them. Just keep going forward. You got this. That is not the gospel. The gospel is repent and believe. That's the gospel. Turn from those things and embrace all that God is and has done for you. Look at 1 John chapter 5, verses 4 and 5, last verse. 1 John chapter 5, verses 4 and 5. For every child of God defeats the evil world. I would include religious and irreligious ways of thinking. Every child defeats this evil world, and we achieve this victory through our determination. No, I have the wrong version today. I don't know what's going on with this. We achieve this victory through our willpower. No. We achieve this victory through faith. That's it. So I'm not going to argue with you about whether you need to put a filter on your computer. You can do whatever you want to do. You're losing this battle because of faith or lack of faith. I'm not going to argue with you, you know, about what measures you need to put in place to safeguard you against whatever negative emotions you've got or negative thought patterns you've got. All I'm going to do is point you to the good news of Jesus and say, I think there's unbelief somewhere here. Let's find that. Let's root that out. And then belief in those objective realities are going to manifest themselves in all kinds of wonderful ways that give us even more confidence. 
But let's start with belief. In 1 John 5, 4 and 5, he says, For every child of God defeats this evil world, and we achieve this victory through our faith. Faith is the victory. And who can win this battle against the world? Only those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. We're not looking for assurance that we love God or that we've been good enough. We need to look for assurance that God loves us. And that because of Christ's performance and sacrifice for us, it's good enough to give us forgiveness, good enough to give us full acceptance as his children, that we are accepted by God. So where are you? What degree of assurance do you have? What what are you looking to as a basis for salvation? I would ask you, would you want to be sure of your status with God and your relationship with him? Do you believe the things we're talking about? Why wouldn't any of us be sure of these things today? Why would we walk out with any uncertainty? Let me pray.